Good morning, church, and good morning to those of you who are tuning in at home. In a time that feels perhaps what, uh, somewhat quite hopeless right now, we hear these words in Psalm 71, verse 14. As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. Friends, we have a hope as followers of Jesus because he has conquered death. He has conquered sin. He offers us forgiveness. He is risen We have the hope of eternal life. We have the hope of a relationship with the Father, with the creator of this universe. So would you stand and sing together of this hope as we praise our King? Jesus has died and he conquered the grave, he rose again, and so because of that we have that same hope that we will one day rise again to be with him, so let's sing of that now, let's sing death where is your sting, death where is your victory. The grave could not ignore it, when all of heaven's glory, how where is your victory?
sing man of sorrows man of sorrows lamb of god by his own
our God. Why don't you join me as we pray? Father God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to the cross so that we can have relationship with you. We thank you, Father, for the way in which you have loved us and called us to be your children. And we pray, Lord God, that as we open your word together this morning, would you be challenging and encouraging us in our faith and helping us to get a clearer picture of who you are, that we may praise you and glorify you more and more for the rest of this week and for the rest of our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is so good to be with you all at 10 a.m. church this morning. Why don't you grab a seat and welcome someone around you? Okay, well, I'm going to have to cut into those conversations, but it is so good. It is so good to hear so many wonderful conversations happening, and we would love it if you could uh, continue those conversations at the end of our service. And if it is your first time here as a guest with us at St. Paul's Castle Hill, welcome to our church. We are so glad that you have joined us for church this morning. And we would love to help you connect in with our church here. So why don't you head to stpauls.church forward slash connect and fill in your details and a member of our staff will get in touch with you there as well. Now our connect form is also the platform that we use uh, for you to start receiving the loop, which is our weekly update email. Uh, So you can click the prompt there to do that. And we also have an option there. Uh, which allows you to express an interest in baptism, whether yourself or one of your children. And so if that's something you're interested in, head to stpauls.church forward slash connect and click uh, the option that uh, says you're interested in baptism. Uh, Now, we would love it if you could continue giving to support the work and ministry of our church. So why don't you head to stpauls.church forward slash give and follow the prompts there and you can continue uh, to give generously so that we can continue to do ministry both here in the hills and also across the globe. Finally, we are going to have Q&A after the service again as well. So if there's anything that Pat says during the sermon that raises any questions in your mind, or if there's anything in the passage that you want to delve a little deeper in, then head to stpauls.church forward slash Q&A and type in your question there, and hopefully we will have time to get to it at the end of the service. Now, for those of you that are in the room here, you may be looking around and wondering why there are all these extra lights around the room. Well, that is because we are having our recording for our next single with City of Light tonight at 7 p.m. church. So that means a couple of things. First of all, it means if you actually want to be on the recording, whether visually or uh, audibly by singing, then you need to be here at 7 p.m. church tonight. So if you're here at 10 a.m., thanks for coming, and you can come again at 7 p.m. church and hear Pat open the word again. Uh, And the second thing it means is that we need to move our room around a little bit after the service to get the platform set up for our recording. So if a few of you are able to stay around at at the conclusion of our service and help us do that, that would be a great blessing. Right now, I'm going to hand over to Holly, who's going to pray. Why don't you join me as we pray to our great God together. Father God, we come before you tonight as broken and sinful people and remember the ways this week in which we have failed to honour you and those around us, either in thought or in deed or sins we don't even realise we've committed. We see in 1 John 1 that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So, Father God, we repent now and ask for your gracious forgiveness that is offered to us as a result of your son's death and resurrection. Amen. 
God, we thank you for the vital signs we have here at St. Paul's. We pray specifically tonight for the vital sign called people follow. Father, we know from your word that we are called from darkness to light, called to be children of you. I pray that you will be strengthening us daily to follow your commandments. I pray that we would be living, like it says in 1 Peter 2, such good lives among the pagans that they may see our good deeds and glorify God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God, we bring before you now some of the faithful ministers from our own church, specifically Keith Baker in his role as Generations Minister and Acting Senior Minister, Linda Stevens as she oversees all our children's ministries, and Pat Jones in his role as Young Adults Minister. Lord, would you strengthen and sustain them as they serve you? Would you give them wisdom as they oversee their various ministries, strength and peace for when things get stressful, and rest for when they are weary? Amen. Lord, we pray now for our Link Church in Nairobi Chapel in Kenya. We thank you for the work they're doing in their HIV clinic at Life Spring Chapel and as they equip the community to sustain physical needs as well as faithfully proclaiming Christ's love. Lord, we continue to pray for all the compassion children that our congregation sponsors. May you protect them and may they grow in love and knowledge of you. Amen. God, we bring before you now our brothers and sisters serving you in full-time church-based ministry. Specifically, we pray for Holy Trinity Church, Borkham Hills, and their senior minister, Andre Grassi, and St. Paul's Carlingford, and their senior minister, Raj Gupta. Thank you for the gifts you've given these men. We pray for, the, we pray for them wisdom endurance, and endurance as they faithfully serve their con congregations. Amen. Gracious Father, we bring before you now those in our congregation who are sick and suffering. We pray that these people will know your insurmountable peace and be reminded of Psalm 46, that you are both our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. We pray specifically now, Father, for all those who have been affected by the recent floods in Queensland and New South Wales. Would you protect the vulnerable and strengthen all those working to rescue the stranded and feed the hungry? Lord, would our response to their suffering be generous and bring you praise? Also, God, we pray for our brothers and sisters living in Russia and the Ukraine. We ask that you would give comfort to those who mourn, hope for those who despair, and compassion for all who suffer. God, we plead for an end to violence and aggression in these countries. Lord, we pray for the leaders of both countries, that they would know your truth and peace and be transformed by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And finally, Father, we thank you that you are our good shepherd who guides us, sustains us, and provides for us. I pray now for Pat as he comes to preach that his word would be yours and that you would open our hearts and focus our minds ready to hear this from you. We pray all of this in your mighty name. Amen. This morning's reading is from 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. If you have a church Bible, uh, you'll find that on page 1056. So we're reading from 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come, sorry, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God, and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth 
and the spirit of falsehood. It's lovely to be here with you and uh, welcome to everyone who's online as well. My name's Pat. Uh, if I haven't met you before, I would love to meet you after the service. Um, with such a heavy and kind of complicated passage, I thought it would be undignified to mention that the Sharks beat Parramatta last night. Um, so I'll just leave that one go and we'll just dive straight in. Um, but what we are looking at, it is genuinely a very hard passage, and it's one of those ones for as many uh, believers in God, there are, there are different views on this. In every different church, there's a different approach, and uh, all the experts writing on it don't seem to agree with each other. Uh, and there's a lot to explore. And it got me thinking, uh, as I was trying to unpack this passage and trying to understand it, uh, about when you, when you know what's right to do, but you don't kind of have the conviction to go through with it. You know, when you know, you know, I should do this or I should do that, I should get up early and I should get in, into the day, but making that actually happen when the alarm goes off doesn't really kind of click for you. The worst I have with this is with my, my little boy um, as he's doing puzzles. Uh, he loves puzzles and he's getting to bigger and bigger ones and he just takes so long um, and gets it wrong again and again and again and it's hard to not just do it for him. And I know he's learning and I shouldn't, but I kind of just want to push him out of the way and fix it quickly and kind of go, no, those don't go together. The corner's not in the middle. That's not how it works. Please put it there. Uh, but he can't see that bigger picture yet, right? He can't see that bigger picture and then go, okay, how do I piece this all together? And I think we need to have that approach to this passage. We need to think about each piece of the puzzle and how they fit together. There is a lot of complicated things in here, a lot of uh, words that make us uncomfortable, a lot of talk about things like the Antichrist and spirits, and it makes us kind of stand up a little bit and go, oh, what does that mean? What does that look like? And so I want to spend a bit of time looking at each piece of the puzzle, not so we can know bits and pieces, but so we can bring that together and see the bigger picture. And so I'm going to do this in a really simple way. We're going to start by looking at the puzzle pieces. And I wanted profound language for this. I wanted it to sound good, uh, but I couldn't think of any. So we're going to look at the bad guys and the good guys. Does that sound good? The bad guys and the good guys. Um, and then I'm going to make a few observations, and then we'll wrap up from there. Um, but would you pray with me as we dive in? Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity before us to sit under your word. Lord, we come before you in humility uh, as we tackle uh, something that is difficult to understand. We are fully reliant on you and your spirit to work in us. Lord, we come before you and ask that you would speak powerfully, not just that we would understand something, that we would understand you more, that we'd be able to serve you more, that we'd be able to love you more. Lord, many of us in this room need encouragement. Would you encourage us? Many of us need to be convicted. Would you convict us? Would you lead us by your word, through your spirit, to where you want us to be, that we might encounter you here this morning? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's do a quick fly through and we can start to see our, our characters or the pieces of the puzzle. Uh, we can start to see the good and the bad in here. We'll start at chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. So straight away, there's this idea of spirits and the spirits can be believed or disbelieved. And it goes on to say, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So this idea of spirits, which isn't the normal language for this sort of stuff, comes up, and we see that there are many spirits. Some are from God, but some are from the false prophets, people teaching false truths. Right? People are going out and saying the wrong thing, and they represent one part of the spirits, and there is the spirits of God that are, that are kind of testifying to the truth of God, and we are in the middle trying to discern which is which. So we don't have good or bad yet. There's neutral there. We do not believe every spirit, but we need to put them to the test. Why? Because there are people going out and preaching false things. You jump into verse 2, and we get kind of a, a how-to guide. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. So we've gone from, plural, the spirits in the world, to that individual, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. And then straight back into the plural to keep us on our toes. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And here's the good, right? 
the Spirit of God. I'm assuming God's on the good side. I hope you guys are there with me as well. Every that is good and every spirit that comes from God confessing Jesus. You go down into verse 3 and it continues. Every spirit, and the opposite to this, that does not acknowledge Jesus, so you start in the plural, all of those who are in the opposite place, they're not acknowledging Jesus. Uh, they are not, that, that Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. So again, we meet another being, another idea that we're not too familiar with. In fact, outside of John's letters to this group of churches, we don't hear this language at all. It's nowhere else in the Bible. So who is this Antichrist and the spirits of the Antichrist, this idea that there are many spirits not acknowledging who Jesus is, and they are the spirits of the Antichrist. In the same way that the spirits acknowledging who Jesus is are the spirits of God, those who aren't are the spirit of the Antichrist. I'm assuming these are our bad guys. It continues, just in case there wasn't enough new things for us. You, dear children, are from God and, over and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And finally, we settle on some familiar language. The one who is in you. We've heard that again and again and again throughout the New Testament, talking about the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling in us. And the one who is in the world, again, is familiar language. That's talking about Satan. That's talking about the evil one, the deceiver. We know that language. So as we go through, you can see we're going from good to bad, from good to bad, and this picture just get, keeps building and building. We go to verse 5, and it's talking about the effects. They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. Where we are from God, and whoever knows God's, God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. There's our last two kind of spiritual terms for the day, the spirit of truth being the good one, the one that agrees with Jesus, the one that affirms he, was, he came in the flesh, and the spirit of falsehood, the one that aligns with the false prophets who were going out. So we have a big picture of kind of good versus bad here, don't we? We've got a good picture, a big picture of this kind of spirit language, antichrist language, the spirit of God, the one in us, the one in the world, the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood or the spirit of error. So where do we go with this? I'm ho I don't think anyone's feeling more certain about it now than we were five minutes ago. What do we do with this? Well, there's normally two approaches, right? We can either go down the spiritual line, right, where everything's spiritual and, and we, we can make every part of our lives line up with the spiritual realm and everything's flowing in that sort of way. Ephesians, you know, the armor of God, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers and authorities and spiritual beings in the dark realms and all of these sorts of things. We can say, well, this is an, a, a spiritual battle. And what we declare to be truth is caught up in the middle of it. And that would line up with something like 1 Timothy 4 that says, the Spirit clearly says that in the later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. Maybe we could line this up with the, the beast in Revelation 19 and 20. The beast or the liar or the deceiver because they're named one after the other more than one time. Or we can go the complete opposite approach and say this is a physical thing. And when we talk about the spirit, we're talking about like team spirit. You know, the spirit of God. When we say, you know, in, in the spirit of truthfulness, let me tell you something. In the spirit of God's truth, we confess that Jesus has come in the flesh. In the spirit of the liar, we say that he doesn't. Maybe we can make it physical. And we can look at the Antichrist as the false prophets who have gone out into the world. And if you go to 3 John, which is attached to this, you can see that there is one more who is coming, Diotrephes, and he is another false teacher. In fact, he is the leader of these false teachers. And so maybe he is the Antichrist that is to come. And it's very physical, and it's very here, and it's very now. You could say that these spirits are not beings. It's, it's an idea. It's the thought. It's, it's the kind of the movement. Like any argument, we tend to fall way to one side or way to the other. It's almost like when you're picking here, it's like your wife's fighting with your mum and they turn to you and say, which one's right? You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm wrapping up here, guys. Thank you. Um, what do you think? 
How do you, like, how do you approach this passage? What do we do as we try to fit these pieces of the puzzle together? Especially as we read all the different Christian authors coming to different conclusions on it. Well, let's go back through and let's see if we can land on what sort of beings or people or ideas each of these are. The many false prophets is clear. It's been made clear throughout all of John's letters to this group of churches. We know that there are a group who have gone out from the church who are denying that Jesus was God in flesh. They're denying what's called the incarnation of Jesus. God did not put flesh on. They are saying that is not true, and they are being labeled as false teachers. They are the the many false prophets. But in verse 3, every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. Well, we know that the Antichrist, or the Antichrist, many have come and more will come, are clearly marked by the denial of Jesus. It's in the name. They're anti-Jesus. So whether this be an idea or a spiritual being, the idea is that they are pulling you away from Jesus. They are anti the work of Jesus, anti the truth of Jesus. There are many, and we know that the many are these false prophets, the Antichrist, but there is still that one to come. And that may be a future being. Some say it may be a reference to the devil or to Satan. Or it may be a human that is just to come along in the near future for the people receiving this letter. We talk about the one who is in the world, and we know that speaking of Satan. The one who is in you, we know that speaking of the Holy Spirit. And then we land on the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. And we could say that the spirit of truth is the spirit of God, but I think it is talking there about the idea of truth that we know from God and the spirit of falsehood, the idea of falsehood preached by these people. So again, before you can discern exactly who or what we're dealing with here, we need to understand the tension. We need to understand the fight. On one side, you have the Antichrist, the Antichrists, because many have come, the false teachers, the liars, the spirit of error, the spirit of falsehood, and the whole aim of that group is to grab the believers and move them away from Jesus, move them away from his incarnation, from his death, to say that he has not been God come man, die and rise again to save us, to pull us away from that in our belief. And then the spirit of God and the spirit of truth and the witnesses of God taking us in the other direction saying that, no, Jesus did come and he did die and he did give everything for you. And this is what John's whole letter and letters has been about here. You jump back a little bit into chapter 2. Dear children, this is the last hour. As you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Now even many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed none of them belong to us. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and all of you know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and no lie comes from the truth. And this is important. Who is the liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a person is the Antichrist. Such a person is the Antichrist. You can see humanity being attached to this idea of the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. There's only one more part in all of Scripture that uses the language Antichrist, and it's in 2 John. It says, I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the Antichrist. Congratulations, you've now exhausted every passage on the Antichrist in the Bible. And it feels odd, it feels not fulfilling. John, who also wrote Revelation, doesn't use this language there. When he talks about what is to come in this big picture, in this uh, kind of battle at the end times, he's not using Antichrist language. So what do we do? What do we know? How do we conclude on these puzzle pieces? Well, let's put a bit of information in there that we do know from other parts of Scripture. No one except for God is in all places at all times. Satan, the evil one, or if you want to say the Antichrist in that, cannot be in multiple beings across all of the earth. Satan's spirit cannot inhabit all of us in the way that God's spirit can dwell in all of us. There isn't an evil being who can do that. 
We also know that this isn't some subversive secret spiritual attack, but this is straight down the line trying to help people, trying to make people deny who Jesus is and deny what he has done. The context that John is writing to is all about falsehood and it's all about declaring that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus was God become man and dwelt among us. We know from this passage that this Antichrist and the Antichrist have come and are now to come. So there are deceivers and there will be more deceivers. It could be some anti-Jesus leader who hasn't come yet or it could be the many that have come and will continue to come. We know this tension is now and it is real. The idea here is that evil is pushing you away from Jesus, drawing you away from Jesus. And we see the exact opposite with the good guys. The Spirit of God acknowledging that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. That we are dear children and we have overcome them. Why? Because the one who is in us is, the one, is greater than the one who is in the world. Now we're talking about the Spirit, the Spirit of truth. And again and again it comes back to whoever acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God. This threefold truth. Jesus Christ has come. Doesn't mean he just turned up, it means he existed before he was human and he became flesh. So he was and is God and took on flesh and that he is from God. John summarizes this a little bit in verse 6 by saying, We are from God and whoever listens to us, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. And you might think, well, John, that's pretty arrogant, right? If you listen to me, you're in the spirit of truth. You're on God's team. You're going well. If you ignore me, you're in the enemy. You're in the evil. But he's referencing back to the start of this letter. That which was from the beginning, he says, which we have seen, which we have touched, which we have seen with our eyes, we have held with our hands, which we have looked at, which we have listened to. He's talking about his first-hand interaction with the real physical human that is Jesus, John, the, the one who rested his head on the chest of Jesus and heard his heart beating. He's saying, this is God in a human body. I know I was there. And he's giving authority by Jesus to go out and preach. And he says, listen to us because I'm testifying about Jesus. And I want to share his hope with you and his truth with you. It all ties back to this confession of Jesus. It's all about the person and the work of Jesus. And I want to say, like, I can hear already my friends saying, Pat, don't, like, unspiritualize it. The church already doesn't walk in step with the Spirit enough. We're too like, shy to talk about spiritual things. We don't think about the work of the Holy Spirit in our life enough. And, and amen, I am with you. But can I tell you, as we talk about confessing the name of Jesus, confessing the incarnation, the death and the resurrection, the work of Jesus Christ, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. This whole passage that we're reading is set up in the two verses that come before it. It says this from 1 John chapter 3. The last two verses, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. One command, believe in Jesus and love. The one who keeps his commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. We know that we are saved in the work of Jesus because of the Spirit. If we stand up and confess, Jesus is Lord. He came and he died and he took my place on that cross and he defeated death and he defeated sin and he defeated guilt and I stand with him in victory. We do that by the work and the power of the Spirit. This is the work of the Spirit. This is the spiritual things. The confession of Jesus because on that everything lives and dies. That is everything for us. It is the highest stakes. And so all the forces, be they physical or spiritual, trying to pull us away are the forces of evil. And those pull the spirit in us and working through us pulls us towards God. And it's not just knowing and saying. It's that Romans 10 idea. Believe, I declare with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And you will be saved. Jesus is Lord. He's in charge. He has a, a place over me to lead me and to rule. And you will be saved. One last time, are we talking about spiritual beings or are we talking about physical beings? Well, John recognizes that the Holy Spirit is there, that Satan is at work, that there are antichrists who are preaching a false message. 
But what I don't see here from John is this idea of a dichotomy. Is it physical or is it spiritual? John doesn't address that. He's not interested in that. For him, the physical and the spiritual aren't two things that can't coexist. We love to say, well, this is physical, so therefore it's not spiritual, or this is spiritual, therefore it's not physical. But John never does that. In fact, other people in the Bible never do that. There is an evil one working in this world, and his aim is to take you away from Jesus. There is a spirit alive and working in you whose aim is to draw you in closer and closer to Jesus. There is an evil one to come, be it Satan or the Antichrist, who's going to teach falsehood about Jesus. There is a good, there is a great one to come whose name is Jesus, who will crush that enemy. There is a spirit of this world drawing us away from the truth and the hope that we have in the gospel. And there is the spirit of God drawing us in again and again and again. John isn't interested in saying, is it physical or is it spiritual? Because he knows that the physical and the spiritual world are collided in the work of God. Our victory is with Jesus. And I think as we read this, if it helps, I don't think we're meant to hear the word spirits here and think about beings, but the idea and the thought and the teaching and the movements that come with that. John so seamlessly moves between the spiritual and the physical, just like the 1 Timothy passage that we read out. Because he isn't trying to create a false dichotomy that it's either physical or it's spiritual, but in the physical world, the spirit is at work. So back to the puzzle, right? If these are the pieces, if we've got the good and the bad, we've got the work of of the spiritual realm, the physical realm, and it's all about the confession of Jesus, if that's the puzzle, here's my issue with, my other issue with doing puzzles with my kids, right? We finish a puzzle, it's all done, it's all nice, and then next, right? You don't get to look at the picture. You don't get to get the idea. And when we come to complicated passages, we do the same thing. Okay, I think the spirits are this. I think the Antichrist is this. I think the many Antichrists are this. The spirit of God is this. The spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. I've got that all sorted. All right, what's next? John isn't writing an intellectual letter here. He's writing to believers like you and me so he can encourage us and move us in our faith. So he can help us face this world. So we need to stop and we need to look at this passage and we need to learn from it as a picture that's built together knowing that there is a battle for our heart and our mind on the truth of Jesus. And so I want to make four observations with these pieces of the puzzle all together. The first one should be obvious. Test. Test. It's right at the start. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. That is a command for you. When you hear teachings, when you hear thoughts, when you see movements, are you testing the spirits? When you sit under teaching in this church, are you saying, is this from God? Is this true of Jesus? Is this true of what the apostles wrote down and kept? Can you test this to be true? Because there are many false teachers out there and many who make error. And the test isn't on the vibe or on your personal ethics The test of right and wrong isn't on your feelings or it's not on stylistic things. The test is on, does it draw me closer to who the Bible tells me Jesus is? Does it draw me to worship him more, to give my life over to him more? Does it tell me that that Jesus became man and died in my place and defeated death? We need to be people who test. Why? Because if we lose that, we lose everything. 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 There is a constant, endless voice in this world. And it might not say, you know, Jesus didn't come in the flesh. It might say, hey, you're more important right now. What about wealth? What about comfort? What about being, you know, safe in this world and in this time? It's not some crazy warfare. It's the deception of believers. And you need to know the Bible. You need to know Jesus in order to test. My second observation is trust the one who is in you. I said this before, but I agree with it. There is an alarming truth that we know so little about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit who is God in us. We need to know that the Spirit is our seal for salvation, that this work of the Spirit is sanctification in us, which means making us look more and more like Jesus, that we do have the spiritual gifts, that the fruit of the Spirit is a work of the Spirit in us, that the Spirit is with us in our prayer, and it is by the Spirit through Jesus that we approach the Father in prayer. We need to know him as a counselor. We need to know as we want to step out and evangelize and talk about this Jesus, as we want to go into battle against these false ideas, that he is our strength and will help us speak. And we need to know primarily the Spirit's work is to draw us to Jesus again and again and again and again. 
says in here, you have the victory because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. We have God alive in us. We need to learn about that and we need to not just have that as an intellectual thing, but we need to learn to walk in step with the leadership of the Spirit in our life. The third observation I want to make is that we need to know our viewpoint. Verse 5 says, They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. As Christians, and I'll say in the hills in this time, we are so anchored to a society that does not know God. We are so anchored to a society that does not know God. We give so much weight in our lives to viewpoints and arguments and ideas that do not come from God or from people who know God. As you read through the the New Testament, you see both Jews and Gentiles really struggling with how their culture and their society will work with this gospel that they've heard and this truth that they heard. And it's kind of this tension as they learn to change and be in Jesus. Where's our struggle? Surely our modern Western culture is far more different from the life that Jesus is calling to than people who are already already worshipping the same God. Where's our struggle and our tension to know our viewpoint, to know that we need to hear God speaking from his view, not from the views of this world? And how does that show in your actions? What's your value system built on? I can say this now because I'm not the youth pastor anymore, so you won't think it's it's about my ministry. Uh, For the parents in the room, what viewpoint do you model to your kids? Do you model the viewpoint of this world or the viewpoint of God? Think about that practically. How often are you late for church versus how often are you late for school? How often do you check up? Have your kids done their homework versus have you spent any time with God today? How often do we have time and money and energy to spend on massive overseas holidays, but no, we can't really give to that cause to further the gospel? What does your actions say about your viewpoint? What are you teaching the next generation? And the fourth point and the last one I want to make, and we'll wrap up here, is that we need to understand the tension. This is the whole point of the passage. Jesus becoming human, walking among us, taking our sin on, nailing it to the cross, dying in our place and rising again. That is all we have. And there is a battle. Many antichrists have come. The deceivers in this world, the false spirits are teaching now and are leading through culture, through ideas, through movements, through um, media and through social media and through everything that happens. There is this movement and this push to take you away from Jesus. And it might be inch by inch. It might be a big, loud thing. But there is a tension and the battlefield is the heart of the believer. The battlefield is your heart. And the prize is your confession of Jesus. But I think we just completely forget that we are in this cosmic tension for our soul. And we need to remind ourselves again and again and again, the one who is in me is greater than the one in the world, that Jesus has overcome all of this evil and one day he will return and he will crush them and we will be taken to glory with him. The confession that Jesus is Lord, that he came as flesh, And the work that he did is not just one for excluding those who are false, but including all that would come to him. We cannot forget that we are in this tension and that this battle is alive and well today. And the battlefield is for your heart and for your eternity. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word and for your truth. God, thank you so much that you love us enough to come and rescue us at the cost of your life on a cross. Lord, help us remember every day that we are in a battle and it's a battle that you have won. And help us to lean into you, to know you and to love you more and more each day. Help us to test the spirits. Help us to understand what is the voice of this world and what is your voice. God, help us to be people who worship you in every moment, in every part of our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, let's stand and sing. Let's focus our eyes on the Lord that loves us and our desire to know Him more.
morning, friends. It is so good uh, to have spent this time together with you. Thank you, Pat, for opening God's Word. Uh, we are about to head to our time of Q&A, so if you do have any last-minute questions that you'd like to send in, you have just a couple of minutes to do that. But as we finish the main portion of our service, I'd love to leave you with these words from the end of Jude's letter. To Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before His glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. We look forward to joining you in just a couple of minutes for Q&A. Welcome back for our Q&A. I am joined here by Pat, who opened God's Word so well for us this morning, and Paul Lucas, our discipleship minister. Great to have you guys here to answer some of these fantastic and complicated questions that we have. Um, before we get into that, let's get into a few uh, encouragements. First of all, thank you, Pat. What a blessing it was to hear you speak faithfully and honestly. Uh, the second one, thank you for faithfully bringing today's sermon, Pat. But come on, the eels were robbed, is the statement. <laughs> well, as a Panthers fan, I'm just going to bask in the glory of winning the premiership last season. So, yeah. The only <laughs> thing that was stolen was Nico Hines stealing my heart last <laughs> night. That was it. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into some of the questions. Uh, our first question is, uh, it, it has a quote from Mark 1, which we'll get to in a second, and says, is this a good spirit or a bad one as it acknowledges Jesus? And the quote says... Just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Patty, you want to take us away? Can you read the first line again? Yeah. Is this a good spirit or a bad one because it acknowledges Jesus? Yeah, I think um, there's some passages that speak clearly into this. Um, it says, So you believe good, even the demons um, believe and they shudder. Um, 
and so the passage we we're looking at today, John was addressing one sort of falsehood, the idea that Jesus didn't take on flesh, and his language encompasses the others as well. Uh, but of course, there are evil beings, there are demons uh, who have the knowledge of who Jesus is. Uh, it's about the place of Jesus. Um, and this might speak into one of the other passages there, but um, the, that Romans 10, 9 verse, if you believe uh, in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, then you'll be saved. We like to cheapen salvation by saying, all you have to do is believe, but it's believing that Jesus has that place of lordship in your life, which is a place of authority where he leads you, where you uh, submit your life underneath him. Uh, so that's in your heart, and that's the position that Jesus takes. That's the, the good spirit, um, where any evil spirit or deceiver or any person can say, yep, I believe Jesus was there. Um, I believe he was a person. I believe he was from God, um, but not have him as Lord. I think that's where you go to say that they're evil. Yeah. Oh, I think I, I would just add, thanks for that answer, Pat. I think I would just, um, it, it, it's in the context of Jesus being there and being spoken to by the evil spirit. Remember, this comes after Jesus has um, overcome Satan in the desert, uh, in the wilderness. So he's, he's uh, proven himself innocent and proven himself faithful to God. Um, so this spirit is speaking into that uh, context to Jesus as, as perfect, as the Holy One of God. He can say that because... That's exactly who Jesus is. It's not like the demons are going around proclaiming it to everybody. It's in the presence of Jesus, so he might know. The other thing to remember about Mark is that Jesus always tells the demons to be quiet, right? It's a kind of a theme through the book of Mark. So it's, he's keeping that kind of thing suppressed until he gets to the cross where he will be fully revealed as the Son of God. So it's an evil demon. It says there it's an impure spirit. Uh, so we have to take it that way. Um, but you can't, you, the, the spirits also can't deceive Jesus. Like if he survived the wilderness and wasn't deceived when he was in the wilderness, then he can't be deceived and the spirits know that as well, like we can. Yeah, that's really helpful. I think John as well, earlier in his letter, almost answers this question where he says in 1 John chapter 2, whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person. So clearly it's being a Christian and, and being or the good and bad spirit, it's, it's more than just acknowledgement of who Jesus is, but it's acknowledgement and obedience and, and conforming to His will, as, as these guys have unpacked already. So that's really helpful. Um, all right, next question. How do we know that Satan can't be in multiple places at once? <laughs> um. So the, the comparison I made was that Satan doesn't share the power of God in that, you know, God by his spirit can dwell in uh, unlimited number of people. Um, we uh, know Satan as a lesser being than God who fell from heaven or was kicked out of uh, heaven or out of God's presence in that sense. Um, and so we know that in that sense, he doesn't have that power and that capacity. Um, he can influence the whole world at once and the uh, lies and the fallenness of this world um, through that Satan will work to influence the minds and the hearts, but he cannot indwell in that in the sense of being i guess a, a fallen angel might be a good language there yeah i would just say he's a created being like we are he's confined by time and space like we are so yeah fantastic all right moving on to a more practical question uh we might hear from both of you on this if if that's okay uh the question says since the hills is a bible belt have you encountered any spiritual warfare in the hills or do most just brush it off as imagination Um, yes, yeah, I would say I have in encountered spiritual warfare. Um, it hasn't been in the sense of seeing a, a demon or uh, anything like that, or, you know, like that sort of night terror-y uh, thing, but uh, I've definitely felt that pull away from, from God to, you know, the, the secular arguments and the ideas to push away. Um, I've definitely felt the influence of evil in that sense. Um, and I've felt in different situations at different places, like there has been a sense of spiritual attack more on an emotional level uh, or a mental level. Um, and that's just something that I've responded to in prayer. Um, and alongside that, less so personally, but a lot of testimonies of people around me that I trust and believe um, of spiritual warfare. Um, I think one of the most powerful things that Satan can do is to convince us that he's not real and that he's not doing things. Um, and if for the West in general to make generalizations, that means to be subtle and to be quiet and to not be tangibly noticeable, then that might be more powerful than kicking and screaming and images and, you know, big fiery things. Uh, and I think that's what we're at risk of. But we're also at risk of the other side as well. All of that said, the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. Um, and so we have 
strength in Christ and we have victory in Christ and the spirit in us. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think I've seen some. Has anyone been to the towers? Oh, that's a, I'd call that a temple. Um, so I think there is spiritual warfare going around on that level. Uh, I think many parents, you, you know how your kids want to play sport and you're not sure whether you should bring them to church or take them to sport? I'm not bagging sport. I love it. I played a lot. But it's attention, right? That's the warfare. You need to figure that out according to your conscience and according to the word of God. You figure that out. But I think that sort of thing is a battle. Uh, to get out of bed on a Sunday morning and come and be with God's people. Yeah, it's easy just to stay at home, isn't it? And, uh, and not do that. So I think there are those kinds of things. Remember, they're spiritual battles because the spiritual battle is deception. The devil wants to deceive you, to say, not, not to say that you'll worship him, but so that you won't worship God. So that's not what he wants you to do. So the, the, we've got to watch the spiritual warfare is always there because you're, we're always being deceived. He's trying to put ideas and questions in our heads that will take us another way and I would actually argue that that's been since Genesis 3 did God really say so we're always in a spiritual warfare I think it's in the hills uh, I think there's some spiritual warfare coming our way um, if the if the articles in the magazines and things at the moment uh, we're going to have to look after our brothers and sisters around us at the moment because there's a real spiritual battle coming so I think yes we do see it in the hills I might just add that with the idea of spiritual warfare, uh, if you look at um, the language around the armour of God, uh, it talks about taking your stand, uh, and that military idea of taking your stand, it says it three times when it gives us the armour of God, take your stand, take your stand, take your stand. That means we have the ground we want, we will not be moved, which is the idea that John picks up in this letter. We're trying to be deceived and taken away from Jesus. We have victory, and we stand in victory, and we live in victory, and we live in an eternal victory when we stand with Christ. And so as we actively worship and as, as we, um, by the work of the Spirit, grow more and more like Jesus, that's us winning in spiritual warfare. It doesn't just have to be some evil thing coming at us to, to be in spiritual warfare, but every day choosing to spend time in the Word, in prayer, encouraging a brother or sister, showing hospitality, coming to church. That's all spiritual warfare, and it's all done for believers of Jesus from that place of victory and from that ground that has been won and that is eternal. I was just going to, the second part of the question that says, um, almost just brof, brush it off as imagination. I, I, what I'm hearing in that question, I forgive me if I'm wrong, but what I'm hearing in that question is, I'm saying to God, I've got this. So I'm just imagining it because it's not really there because I've got to, I'm in control. Um, so I think that's kind of dangerous. No, it's not kind of, it is dangerous. Um, so yeah, be careful that that doesn't become your posture. I got this. Yeah. And the other thing is, I don't know, if, sorry, Ben. Uh, if you're interested in reading about this kind of stuff, uh, if you, uh, there's a great book by Graham Cole called Against the Darkness, which can help you with that. Peter Bolt's written a great book called Living with the Underworld. Maybe some of those things, if you want to get a hold of them, can um, help you if you want to look at that and talk more. Yeah, that's really helpful. I think uh, for me as well, uh, I've been learning at college recently about um, the animistic worldview and, and how they seek to engage with spirits through shamans and and witch doctors and and a lot of that sort of stuff and that's very different to our worldview here in the west as pat sort of touched on and so it doesn't lessen the spiritual um uh, existence or the spiritual warfare that we face here it just shows that it rears its head in different ways and i think as pat said it was really helpful that um satan's biggest weapon in our world is to make us think he doesn't exist not dissimilarly to the church in Laodicea, where they're lukewarm and they're just complacent, comfortable coasting, and Satan almost doesn't have to do anything to them because they ruin their own salvation in their nothingness. Uh, and I think in the West, we can fall into a similar trap versus, um, you know, people in, in other cultures and from different worldviews who are, uh, you know, experience spiritual warfare in a far more visual and physical uh, way than we do here. Uh, let's move on. So, here we go. Let's do this one. In today's passage, testing of the Antichrists uh, and the Antichrist spirit is obvious. However, in some cases, it can be very subtle where those who claim to be part of the body of Christ uh, teach in a way that is incongruent to the Spirit of God. How do you test these subtle spirit... Uh, sorry, the question is just worded. How do you test this subtlety if it is the right spirit or not? Do you want me to repeat that question? <laughs> I'll try and reword it. Okay, in today's passage, the testing of the Antichrist spirit is really obvious. However, in some cases, it can be very subtle. 
Uh, some people may claim to be part of the body of Christ, yet their teaching may be slightly incongruent to what the Word of God reveals to us. How do we test in these subtle cases whether the person preaching has a good spirit or a bad spirit? Um, so I think there's, there's a few different ways to approach this. I think the, the basic answer is you have to know your Word, uh, and you have to know what the Bible teaches about Jesus. Uh, there's no other way around that. Um, and you see through church history, people who came to faith would then go to like Bible school for a period of time so they knew their word and so they could test. Um, we, and particularly for uh, the adults in the congregation, we need to know our word. And that is a calling on you that you have to follow up. And if you think, oh, it's so far off until I could be at that point, then start today so it's closer um, and get to know the word, get to know Jesus so you can t test the subtleties. Um, but also, when we're testing subtleties, we need to understand what is a claim about the lordship of Jesus or the incarnation of Jesus or the resurrection of Jesus versus what is a, a theological secondary issue. Um, so there are things that you might disagree with someone on and you might be like, hey, I don't think that's from the word. Um, but they were saying in good conscience, no, I do think it's from the word. And that's not the same issue that we have here. Um, there are disagreements. There is, you know, theological tensions, uh, places where people won't see eye to eye on the Bible. That's not what John's addressing. But uh, whoever wrote the question, you are right. There are people who will subtly edge away from the truth. Uh, and the only way to, to combat that is to know the truth and to know the word uh, and to do what it says at the start, test it and test it and test it. Um, and if it's slowly easing away from the word, then that's when you ask questions and ask other wise people and bring them in as well. I said a couple of minutes ago that um, Jesus can't be deceived and that's why he can encounter these demons. So if Jesus can't be deceived and we are we are being sanctified to be more and more like Jesus, then I think it's a growth process. Right? So we get better at seeing the subtleties and dealing with them as we become more and more like Christ. We're not going to know everything at the start. In fact, we won't know what we need to know until we get to heaven. So uh, don't be too much pressure on yourself because not every preacher gets it right every time. So we, as we grow, you learn the subtleties. You learn to figure them out. You can hear things. Uh, and as you base your life on the gospel you will see things come to light. And so if you want to think practically on that, then think before you speak. Oh, that's what Dad always used to say to me, probably because I spoke too much. But think before you speak. How does this, what I'm saying here, line up with the gospel of Jesus Christ as it's been handled down to us by the apostles? Right? Then we can see the subtleties in things. And often when um, people will talk to you about... Um, I was talking to someone last week. Oh, I can't remember what, they, oh, what were they saying. Oh, um, they, they talked about. I asked them what the gospel was, and they said that you know Jesus provides a way for us to get to the to heaven. Right? Now that's true, right? Or does Jesus provide the way? Now that's a a thing over language, but honestly, there's a difference. And um, you'll hear those subtleties as you grow in Christ, as you live by the gospel. Things will become more apparent to you. And just learn to think before we speak. Yeah, I think as well, if I could add quickly, uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's, we don't want to jump straight to the idea of a subtle mistake equals a bad spirit, you know. People, as they're growing in their faith, will learn more and more about God. And, you know, I think of Priscilla and Aquila who heard a guy preaching the Word of God in Acts and were like, oh, he's passionate, but he doesn't quite have it right, and took him under their wing and trained him in, in the true reading of the Scriptures and then equipped him to go out and preach passionately. Um, and so, you know, subtle, a subtle mistake does not equal a bad spirit. People might just not quite understand something fully. The other thing that I think of is Paul's words in Philippians 1, where, um, you know, there are people who are preaching Christ out of selfish gain and all that sort of stuff. And Paul's response to that is, what does it matter so long as Christ is preached? And I think we can take that same uh, mindset. If someone we think may be unhelpful in the way that they're articulating things, but they're preaching the truth faithfully, then we should be celebrating that Christ is being preached and that He's being glorified. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would add. Great. Okay, well, that's all that we have time for, unfortunately. Uh, if you do not add, currently receive the loop, make sure you head to stpauls.church forward slash connect because Pat will be answering your questions that we didn't get to this week. Thanks, Pat. Um, now, last week was Global Outreach Sunday. Uh, do you want to chat a little bit about how it went, Paul? Oh, it was a great day. It's good to see Chris and Heron here again. Um, uh, we raised about... Uh, 
about $58,000 of what we of our goals. So that's fantastic. So we know that we can um, faithfully look after our missions this year. So thank you for your generosity. It was a great day. It was great hearing Chris preach. It was great hearing from all our other missions. So thank you for your participation last week. And if I hear that and I go, 58, we're aiming for 75, and God's pushing my spirit to say, hey, contribute to that. Is it too late, Paul? No. <laughs> and how would I go about that? No, it's not too late. How would I act on giving? Oh. Well, I'm uh, up here as best I can. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping that you might know. Um, <laughs> you, you go to the uh, church website, it'll tell you the church bank details there and put in the description GO for global outreach. That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, well, I might just close in prayer and then we can finish our service. Father God, we do thank you uh, that you are with us by your Holy Spirit until the very end of the age. Uh, God, we, we praise you for what we've heard this morning. We pray that you may help us to stand firm against uh, false teachers and against false spirits and, and people who deny the incarnation of Jesus. Uh, and would you help us to always keep our eyes to focus on you and what you have done for us through Christ. Uh, we thank you for our service this morning and pray expectantly for how you're going to work in and through us this week. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen again.